Let's pray with me. Speak to us, O oh God, through the voice of your ever present spirit, through the witness of scriptures, and through the gift of your holy community, that we might grow in faith. Amen. I don't know if you're like me, but I find that today's texts about sheep and shepherds leave me just a little bit, how shall I say, uneasy. It isn't that I have a problem with God caring for us. I mean, I like the pleasant pastures and the still waters. I even feel a lot of comfort in the image of God accompanying us through the dark valleys of our lives. What I don't like about the scripture passages today, though, is the notion that we are sheep. I mean, come on, sheep are, well, there's no two ways about this. They're dumb. They're smelly. I mean, I guess they're kind of woolly and cute and all of that, but the last time that I checked, sheep weren't exactly the kind of animal that you would want to have on your family crest. They aren't known for being fierce or brave or intelligent. But then again, I don't suppose most of us would want to be compared with goats or cows or any other herding animal. Still, today is the fourth Sunday of the season of Easter, and just like every year, we celebrate Good Shepherd Sunday. We celebrate the resurrected Christ, who is indeed our Good Shepherd. And whether we like it or not, we have the role starring as God's sheep, at least for the day. But you know, I think that when we come to these texts, we have another problem. As Americans, when we think of sheep, we tend to think of, oh, light of lamb. But in the ancient world, sheep were commonly not eaten. Now, don't get me wrong, every so often you'd have lamb. But most people who owned sheep kept them for the wool and for milk. And so if you think about that difference between our culture and the culture of Jesus' time, we're being told that we are safe, that we're cared for. Not that as God's sheep we have much likelihood of ever ending up on the dinner table. Often, when we read the scriptures from today, particularly the 23rd Psalm, we only hear those happy portions about green pastures and still waters. But we know that this is a text that we turn to so often in times of greatest loss, in the times of despair. When we walk through those dark valleys of the world, when we gather at gravesides and remember loved ones who have passed into God's eternal care, it's then that we really know the power of the psalm. Knowing that God leads us not only to the good things in life, but also guides us through those dark, dark times. And I'm not going to ask you about your personal dark times. Something tells me that they're already coming to mind. God is with us, caring for us, providing for us, accompanying us on our journey, offering peace and hope and solace. You know that. You've experienced it in your own lives. When things look like they couldn't get any worse, when that valley of the shadow of death loomed large, you've experienced the comfort of God's presence. And in many ways, that experience that has brought us to this place, that has brought us out the other side of that valley, 
is probably a place where I can stop and say, Amen, and sit down. What better sermon is there, really, than the acknowledgement of God's care for us? But our reading today from the Gospel of John takes us from those pleasant pastures and still waters to a very different place. As we see Jesus taking on the role of shepherd that had been God's role in the book of Psalms. This shepherd, though, doesn't just lead the flock. He lays down his life for it. Since we're now only four weeks into the season of Easter, we still have fresh in our minds the image of the cross. And it's only too easy for us to remember the desolation of Good Friday, even though we know the reality of Easter victory. The epistle of 1 John makes clear to us that Jesus isn't the only one laying down his life for others, or at least he shouldn't be. It reads this way. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or a sister in need, yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. So now you see we're not only sheep, but we're called to give our worldly possessions and even our very lives for our sisters and our brothers, for those in our flock. We are called to lay down our lives for those who are part of our shepherds, other sheep, too. It can make it a little uneasy, can it? But you know, there's another thing that leaves me uneasy about today's reading. The thing about sheep and shepherds is that unwritten notion of how pastors are expected to be shepherds and how the congregation is sheep, of how clergy are the ones responsible for calling the shots and making sure that everyone is taken care of no matter what. And while I know that there are plenty of pastors out there who agree with me that the idea of being a shepherd is really quite daunting. There are also a few of them out there who really want to be the ones calling the shots. Of course, in Protestant theology, we have a couple problems with that idea. The first one is that notion that there's no distinction between the clergy and lay people in God's eyes. That we're all called to do God's work. In fact, if you'll pardon me giving you a Greek lesson, the word laity, or lay people like, like you, comes from the Greek word laos, which means work. To be among the laity is to be those who do God's work. There's a second problem, too, though. And we in the United Church of Christ perhaps know this more than any other denomination. You see, leading a congregation in the United Church of Christ is much more like herding cats than it is like herding sheep. Don't we all want to go off and do our own thing? Oh, come on, you can at least not. Just admit this. We all want to do our own thing. We may have congregational meetings and take votes and all of that, but our reality is that we are an independent and sometimes even they can anchor us. But still, God loves us. Aren't we lucky? But here we are, God's people, gathered together as one community, as equal in God's eyes. Each one of us in need of Christ's shepherd. But you know, 
there's something about sheep. Because all sheep are not indeed created equal. Not too terribly long ago, Great Britain was facing an outbreak of the disease scrapie, which is the sheep equivalent of mad cow disease. And the British government ordered that entire herds of sheep be destroyed. Of course, it was a huge loss to the farmers who depended on the sheep for their livelihood. But it turned out that there was an even greater loss that took place. Among the sheep that were put down were the old ones, those who had learned their grazing grounds, who knew where they were supposed to go. And as the shepherds rebuilt their flocks with new sheep, they had to go out and retrain their whole flock to teach them where to go, to teach them how to live in that particular place. Each flock is supposed to have at least one lead sheep. And the term for that sheep, by the way, is a bellwether, a term that we now usually hear in conjunction with the stock market as those stocks that lead either in increase or decline. But a bellwether is literally a sheep, a weather, who wears a bell around its neck. This is the sheep who leads the flock, the one who knows the voice of the shepherd the best. And bellwethers are crucial to the operation of the flock because they know where to go. They know how to get there. They've learned the voice of the shepherd and they've learned to come when called. Back when I was in high school, I worked at my girlfriend's father's farm. <coughs> And I'll be honest with you, we didn't know any sheep. The most colorful animal of the whole farm, though, was Odie. Odie was a Hereford bull. Now, Odie never really had a chance in life. You see, he was the only bull living on a farm that was full of dogs. And from the time he was just a calf, he would run with the dogs. And I am convinced that Tony believed that he was a dog. He was a one-person bull or dog, depending. If Michelle or I would go out to the field and call, Tony, he would cheerfully ignore us. But if Michelle's father, Mike, went out and called, Tony would be right there. He'd come galumphing across the pasture, and that's where the trouble would really start. Because thinking he was a dog, he wanted to jump up and put his paws on your shoulders. Of course, as a bull, he didn't have paws, he had hooves. And he had about a ton of weight behind him. Which is why we kept an axe handle on the truck, just to keep holding it up at a safe distance.
And so on this Good Shepherd Sunday, may we learn to follow the voice of our shepherd. May we find the courage to lead others in right paths. And may we find that when we follow the voice of our God, whether leading others or not, that our way leads us indeed to pleasant.